This week on Off the Air, Phil Jubileo. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Off the Air. I'm Kayla Wen here with Alex Walls, and today we are pleased to be joined by the lead play-by-play -play announcer for the Connecticut Whales in the NWHL, Phil Jubileo. Phil, thank you so much for being here and for taking the time to talk to us today. Kayla, Alex, it's great to be aboard with you on Off the Air. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks so much for having me. So we're going to get right into it here. When did you know that you wanted to be a sports broadcaster? When was that the career that you knew you wanted? It's interesting. I think I knew as early as high school that I wanted to be involved in sports in some way. Now, uh, for a little known fact, some people know this, some people don't. I was a caller to one on one. So this is another reason why I'm really excited to be here. I was a regular caller starting, I would say, my sophomore year in high school. And just like many of the old time callers from back in the 80s and 90s, I had a, I had a nickname that I used for on the air. I was Mr. Milwaukee. And I'm not from Milwaukee. I grew up in the Bronx. I grew up in Throgs Neck. Yeah. So it's a rather odd name to have for someone that called the show. But here's how that happened. I was turned on to the show by someone else that was a regular caller, T from the Bronx. I got to know him in... Uh, a simulation computer baseball league. Yes, back in the 80s, they had computers. And yes, in the 80s, they had simulation baseball games. This one was called Micro League Baseball. And I ended up joining a league that was based on the west side of Manhattan uh, through a newsletter that they used to send. Micro League Baseball was a really popular video game for the Commodore 64, which is what I played it on. And there was a newsletter where you could learn about leagues. And this was an in-person league up on the Upper West Side and I joined the league and growing up, and you can see the Mets sign in the background, a big time Mets fan. Unfortunately, the Mets were not available as a team in the league. I joined a little bit late and I picked the Milwaukee Brewers. So that was for the 1987 season. And that was the team that we were playing with. And T from the Bronx told me, oh, here's a weekend sports calling show. You would really like it. It's on the station WFUV. And he told me it was on 11 p.m. to 2 a.m. on Saturdays and Sundays. I listened for a few weeks. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm going to start calling the show. And that's what I did. And I became Mr. Milwaukee because everybody that called the show, you know, wasn't like Joe from Rego Park calling the show it wasn't like Bob and Bensonhurst. It was everyone had a nickname back at that time for some reason. And that's how I got my nickname. That's how I got interested in eventually attending Fordham because I wanted to be a host of the show uh, and eventually get to that point. And I was, I was happy that I eventually did. That's incredible. I think it's the first time we ever had a caller to, to the one-on-one -on -one, uh, show. And I think that's awesome. So you grow up in the Bronx, you come to Fordham. I mean, it seems like a match made in heaven now, a caller of the show. So what were your first days on the Rose Hill campus like? I think just a, a pretty typical of any college student on the Rose Hill campus. I only looked at a few different colleges. When I went into school, I knew I wanted to work at WFUV. As I said, I wanted to work in sports. I wasn't quite sure if that meant being a sportscaster for the rest of my life or doing something else. Actually, for some time, I thought, you know what? I might become a player agent. Uh, the high school that I went to, uh, St. Raymond High School in the Bronx, and still does to this day, has a very, very big basketball program. In fact, my senior class was the first time they won the uh, Catholic League Championship my senior year. And I got to go, and, and I was in classes with players like Orlando Antigua, who eventually played for the Globetrotters, and Terrence Rencher, who went to Texas and then played in the NBA for a little bit and had a long career over in Europe. And, and I got to know some of those guys and I thought, oh man, this would be great to be a player agent. And back then I was all about basketball and baseball as a kid and thinking, okay, this is what I want to do. I'm going to become an agent. I'm going to major in business, uh, maybe go to law school eventually and do all of that. And then I learned a little bit about the, the underbelly uh, especially at that point of being a player agent. It, it's a very aggressive world. It's very cutthroat. And, and that wasn't for me. And once I got a little bit more involved at WFUV, I thought, hey, you know what? I can do this. It's sports. I really like it. Uh, I enjoy being on the air. And that is kind of when I started to uh, take my career path in that direction, even though I did keep my business major. So what were some of your first jobs when you got to FUV and you started working there? What were some of the first assignments that they put you on? 
some of the very early assignments my my freshman year after going through the sports workshop uh, was I eventually got to do some one-on-one hosting, but it was a lot of afternoon sports casts. It was doing halftime shows on men's and women's basketball, getting to do a little bit of that. And as a freshman, I did not get very many on-air opportunities. You have to remember, this was back in the early 90s, and we didn't have the internet. So the extent of what was on air at the time for WFUV sports was really limited to morning and afternoon sports casts and game broadcasts. And at that time, the only sports that we broadcast were football and men's basketball. Women's basketball was a complete afterthought. They were not carrying the games. There was obviously no streaming or online presence, nothing involving video, no podcasting or anything. So it was very limited in what you could do. And it was still a fairly sizable staff with a lot of competition. Uh, I think I want to say there were at least 20 on the staff at that point. So you had to work hard to get an opportunity to, to work on the air. So I was lucky to get a few chances my freshman year. And I want to say in the spring of 1992 was the first time I had a chance to work a one-on-one show. And the very first show I did was with Chris Carino, Mm -hmm. Uh, of course, the voice of the New Jersey Nets, and he does NFL and lots of other stuff. And he was amazing to work with. So it gives you also an idea as to how long ago I started at WFUV. So then that's my next question. So you started off as a caller to the show. You then host the show. You get to do a few play-by-play broadcasts. When did play-by-play in particular, and now obviously getting into hockey, when did that become the main, uh, the main occupation for you at the station and now a career? Uh, once in my freshman year, I got to sit in on a Marty Glickman workshop. And this was 1990, I think it was winter of 91. And I got to sit in on one workshop because at that point, I had just finished doing the sports workshop. I had just been approved to do some on air. And at that point, the only people really hanging around Marty at that time were some of the upperclassmen and really the staff members that did a fair amount of the play-by-play and color commentary. But we were invited as freshmen one day to sit in on the class. It was Marty Glickman's last season of doing the New York Jets on radio. At that point, his career was kind of winding down as he was heading into semi-retirement. And I got to sit there and just listen to him for about an hour, hour and a half talking about play-by-play. He brought in one of his spotting boards that he used, and he played back some of uh, the Jets broadcast. And then he went into some of the, the staffer's work. And I was just... I was in a trance. I was just like, wow, this guy's amazing. And the whole, all the science behind the play-by-play work really just got to me right away. And I thought, okay, I'm going to start getting serious about this. And once I began eventually my sophomore year at Fordham, yeah, I started doing demos and sitting in the stands and getting involved in that and going to all of the Marty Glickman workshops. And I was hooked. At that point, once I was able to get on a microphone and do the play-by-play of a Fordham football game for a demo and eventually a basketball game, I was I was in hog heaven and I wanted to do this for the rest of my life. So then why hockey? How did you get into hockey? Because Fordham doesn't really have any hockey team or any um, type of hockey play-by-play that you could have worked with. So how did you get into this sport? It's an interesting story. I had been in broadcasting for a long time before I had an opportunity to call a single hockey game. And that started back in 2003. Uh, Before then, I was the sports director for two years. My junior and senior year, I was a sports director. Uh, This was before Bob Ahrens was there kind of overseeing things. It really had Marty as kind of that consultant advisor for us on play-by-play, but otherwise it was entirely student-run and student-managed. And I was lucky for two years to be able to manage the sports department and do a lot of football and basketball play-by-play. I even did a little bit of baseball uh, play-by-play right when I became sports director. The Fordham baseball team at that point played in the ECAC tournament and the winner of the ECAC tournament would go to the NCAA regionals And they played them up in Waterbury, Connecticut that year. And all the seniors were gone. They graduated. That left it up to me. And we went and covered it for a week. And if they made the final, the championship game, they said, okay, you're going to broadcast the games. 
and a colleague of mine, and uh, you know, the two of us went up there. We stayed for the week. Lo and behold, they made it to the finals against Lemoyne College. They actually won and got to the regionals. And the interesting thing is Charlie Kuchara, uh, who's um, he works for MSG now. He's worked there for a million years on Islanders telecasts, uh, was the pitcher that won the game. What makes that interesting is he was also on the WFUV sports staff. Uh, he was a one-on-one -on -one host, and uh, he was a sophomore or junior at that point. So it was fun to do that. Anyway, lo and behold, how did I get into hockey? I was out of broadcasting for a couple of years in the late nineties, I moved to Seattle. I was working in technology, still on the broadcasting side, very early streaming content, uh, streaming audio only through like dial up measures. It was completely antiquated, but at the time it was cutting edge, but I was out of sports casting for a while. Uh, I eventually ended up in the St. Louis area because of the seattle.com bubble of around 2000, 2001. And when I got to St. Louis, uh, I was working, I was doing database work, you know, just working in tech as a database manager. The opportunity came up for the minor league baseball team in our town, the River City Rascals in O'Fallon, Missouri, which is a, a pretty sizable St. Louis suburb to do their play by play. And I thought, oh, wow, this would be great. I don't really like database work and I want to get back into broadcasting. And I was able to get that job. The previous broadcaster had left. I was able to make a connection with the team and I got the job. So the 2002 season comes and goes and the 2003 season comes and goes. All of a sudden, a USHL team decides they're going to play in our market. The owner of the baseball team that I worked for uh, is, was Ken Wilson at the time. Ken Wilson, a very notable name in broadcasting. He was very well tenured in the St. Louis sports market that, at that point. He had been calling St. Louis bl uh, Blues games for about 20 years. Uh, he followed the late, great Dan Kelly. And uh, K-Dubs was the owner of the Rascals. And he comes up to me and says, how would you like to call hockey? I've never called a hockey game. That was my response. So doesn't matter. You're going to be the hockey announcer for this USHL team. Well, how did that happen? Well, Ken decided to farm out our front office to do the sales and marketing for this USHL junior team, which we did not own, but he was able to work a deal out. And as part of that, I was able to get an opportunity to call hockey with zero experience under my belt. And at that point in my life, I had been to approximately one game in person. It was a St. Louis Blues game. Uh, I did have experience when I was still in New York producing New Jersey Devils games on WABC radio. But hockey was really an afterthought at that point. And it was only because I was given that opportunity to do it that I had a chance to call hockey. But even then, uh, in thinking back on it, the lessons I learned under Marty Glickman really played a key role in helping me learn how to be a play-by-play -play announcer because those lessons about telling a story on the radio it really translates into any sport that you can call. And it worked out well for me. And that was the first step and how I got involved in broadcasting hockey. And that's exactly what I was going to ask about, because from some of the other alumni we've spoken to about hockey, it's known as particularly a notoriously difficult sport to call because of the pace of the game and how different it is from others. So for you, coming from basketball and baseball and other sports, now it's transitioning into hockey. What were those first games for you? You mentioned that some of the experiences from Marty Glickman and the lessons he taught were important in, in you know, kind of getting un, uh, some experience under your belt. But what were some of the things that helped you transition into calling hockey? It really helped that I had Ken as a mentor, during my first year, he went back. I called an exhibition game on tape, and he went back and listened to it and, and liked it. Generally, he offered me some thoughts and, and commentary on how uh, I could improve my work. And really, what worked out for me was just the opportunity to sit back uh, by myself because you didn't have the opportunity to work with a color commentator at that time. And just be able to do the games. I got to do 60 games in the USHL, which is, by the way, a really good junior league. It is the only tier one uh, junior league other than the North American Hockey League in the U.S. A lot of players from the USHL eventually go to really good Division One colleges. They go to the NHL uh, across most of these teams, for instance, the year that I worked in the USHL, one of the teams that we covered, Joe Pavelski was the, the best player on Waterloo. Uh, Paul Stasny played for another team. Even the team I worked for, which was awful, 
the St. Louis Heartland Eagles. I mean, they stunk. Uh, they were not a very good team. Had a couple of guys that eventually had some cups of coffee in the National Hockey League, and most of them ended up going to play Division One college. So the league was really competitive, and I had an opportunity to just sit back and do a lot of games with really no pressure, and that was very helpful for me. Uh, when I think about calling sports and the difficulty or the ease of calling sports, I think you have a point in saying that hockey on the radio can be difficult to call because it is very fast paced. Uh, you have line changes every one to two minutes. So the personnel constantly are coming on and off the ice. So that is a little bit of a challenge to learn at first, but I'll be honest. And I did independent minor league baseball for three seasons, about a hundred games a year sitting by myself in a press box and hockey hands down is a much easier sport mm -hmm. to call because with baseball in particular, the action is very easy to call. I'll give you that. It's the inaction. It's all those moments in between after the ball is put in play and the next hitter coming to the plate and just the pitcher working the count. There is so much dead air. And not that you have to fill every moment of that, because as you know, as play-by-play as -play announcers, that's not necessary. You want to let the game breathe a little bit, but you still have to entertain people for three hours, especially baseball now. These games seem to get longer and longer, and it's about telling a story. It's not just about, especially on the radio, feeding numbers to the, to the people listening or watching on television, you get sensory overload. There's other means if you want to get numbers, pure statistics, you have to tell a story. You're really crafting something for the audience. And it's harder to do that in baseball. Whereas in hockey, there's not as much of that because the game really is uh, a lot of the action that goes on. You have very few stoppages in play. And when you do have a stoppage in play, you know, it's just a few seconds before they drop the puck and the game is going on again. So you can really rely on the action a lot more. And to me, it makes it a much easier sport to call. So you talked about how you were in St. Louis and you were working on um, hockey there. How did you kind of get over into the Connecticut Wales and into Quinnipiac hockey? Well, it was a long time before I got to the to the whale in the NWHL and the Quinnipiac Bobcats, a, a whole career of broadcasting hockey. In fact, um, after I was in St. Louis for one year, I went and moved back to the East Coast and worked in the United Hockey League for the Danbury Trashers. Uh, and fans tuning in, if you Google uh, the Danbury Trashers, it was an infamous, and I mean infamous team, uh, for two seasons in the UHL between 2004 and 2006, where I had a chance to call their games. And that was my first taste of pro hockey to, to work in that league and uh, if you Google them, there are numerous uh, fights because the trashers were known for dropping the gloves and fighting. You can get sucked into a rabbit hole of simply watching Danbury trashers fights <laughs> on YouTube. Uh, I highly suggest it. It's entertaining. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the hockey itself was fun, even though we played in a tiny little uh, 3000 seater in Danbury, the Danbury Ice Arena. Uh, the two seasons that they played in the league were, were quite impressive. Uh, for such a short stint. Um, there's a Sports Illustrated short documentary that they put out a few years ago on the team. Uh, I am in the video, uh, as well as some of the other people that were involved in the organization. That gives you a little bit of a sense uh, about the Trashers. But uh, the biggest part of my hockey broadcasting career, nine years in fact, uh, took place after the Trashers ended and I was the lead voice of the Bridgeport Sound Tigers in the American Hockey League for nine years. So uh, basically, you know, hockey's version of AAA, I was their guy. I got to see countless players uh, go right from the Sound Tigers to the National Hockey League. A lot of them are still playing in the NHL. And also during my time there, I got to uh, work as the backup announcer for the New York Islanders. So I've done some NHL games. Uh, I've covered some NHL drafts. I've done features on minor league players for MSG. And that's where I got kind of a lot of my exposure as a broadcaster uh, during that time, during those nine seasons. And then eventually in 2015, my time with the Sound Tigers came to an end. And that's how I was able to hook on with the NWHL, with the Connecticut Whale uh, from the very start of the league. Um, you know, at that point, uh, my wife and I had a newborn baby. Uh, it was a lot of freelance work on the side uh, to, to work Sound Tigers games and also deal with a, a small infant. So 
I took the step back. I still wanted to keep my hand in hockey. And at that point, it was great because the whale played a very short season. Uh, so I was able to still do some games on the side and be involved. And then eventually, after a couple of years of that, I had a chance to jump in and, and work at Quinnipiac University first as a color commentator on the radio. And then eventually move over to the TV side. And now I'm in my second season covering men's play-by-play -play on ESPN+. Plus and my third year with the women's program doing all of their play-by-play -play as well on ESPN+. Plus. You talk about the Danbury trasher. I'll tell you, anytime a logo is a trash can, you know you're in for a good time. So I think that's a good team yeah. right there. A absolutely. It was interesting because the team was announced on April Fool's Day in 2004. <laughs> Uh, so a lot of people initially thought that it was going, that it was a joke. The owner of the team, uh, James Galante, owned it numerous garbage companies in, in Western Connecticut, in Danbury. And uh, folks that are watching or listening tonight on WFUV, when you Google it, because you have to, it's a must. It's your homework assignment to Google the Danbury Trashers. You'll learn a little bit more if you're not already very familiar with them. It obviously makes a lot of sense. And their, one of their first signings happened to be Brent Gretzky, Wayne's brother, yeah. was one of the first signings of the team. So uh, they were very serious about it. And Brent Gretzky, who never, by the way, had much of an NHL career except for a handful of games, was a legendary and prolific minor league hockey scorer where I think one season he had, you know, close to 200 points in the minor leagues. Uh, so he was very good, uh, just not Wayne. He was half of Wayne. That's why he wore number 49 as a player <laughs> instead of 99. Uh, but they were serious about it. And I was able to work out uh, a chance to interview with Jimmy through the UHL league office, which happened to be in the next town over from where I was living in suburban St. Louis at the time. And I flew out to Danbury during the Frontier League baseball all-star break and interview with Jimmy and was able to get the job and then start that fall. And that's really what was the springboard for my hockey career at that point, uh, after just doing one year of junior getting thrown in it, being able to get right to the pro ranks, you know, at a time where it was still fairly competitive because there weren't as many opportunities to do hockey and not as many, uh, you know, locations, you know, now with streaming, everyone can broadcast rather easily. So it was still pretty competitive to kind of get that foothold and, and get your foot in the door. So I was really fortunate at that point. And I do want to ask about the Connecticut Whale, though, because you mentioned that you went there in 2015, and that was the start of the NWHL, and it's a mm -hmm. relatively new league, and it's been growing, though. It's expansion league, started with a few teams, now have a few more. So you mentioned a little bit about what brought you to the league, but I'm just curious, how has it been for you getting involved in, in this sport and seeing it grow over these first few seasons here? It's been great. I, the first game I called was back in the fall of 2015 at Chelsea Piers in Stamford. And it was great because it was a standing room sellout. It was the whale and the, uh, at the time, the New York Riveters. I signed on with the league probably two or three weeks before the first game was actually played. And until the week of the game, they knew they wanted to broadcast. They had no idea where they were going to broadcast it, how it was going to be broadcast. They wanted to do video. The league had no equipment to do video. The very first game, and you can find it on YouTube, uh, they went out and bought a consumer-grade camcorder uh, several days from a Best Buy before the game. I hooked up. I had my own audio gear to broadcast remote. I hooked it up to the camera. They found a way somehow to get this thing onto YouTube, and that was the very first game. I mean, it was the exact definition of do-it-yourself. And, you know, all these years later, now to be on Twitch, uh, second season on Twitch, uh, the broadcasts have been a lot more well-defined, multi-camera shoots, instant replay, uh, really high-quality streams. Uh, it really has grown leaps and bounds in the several seasons that I worked in the league. I didn't do any games this season because everything was up in Lake Placid and the bubble was being produced down in Florida. I wasn't able to head down and do that, but still being able to see that growth over time and the production quality really increase and the popularity of the league really increase over time has been wondrous to see in this. Unfortunately, they haven't completed the season yet because, you know, we're in a pandemic and these things happen. Uh, but to be able to see, you know, one day on Twitch, 
you know, over a million people watching uh, the games over the course of several hours and, and even concurrently over 30,000 watching a single broadcast on a Saturday afternoon is just crazy because, you know, that's not how we started. It was really small when we first got started, but we knew early on that there was definitely an audience for women's hockey. I never called a women's hockey game and probably had not seen very many women's hockey games other than during the Olympics, maybe a little bit during the world championships at that time. But you learn really quickly that there was a lot of high level talent, a lot of competition and passion. And I got hooked. And I think uh, fans that tune in to watch the NWHL or women's hockey in general, if they haven't seen it before, Definitely watch. It's a bit of a different game than the men's uh, in several instances, but but equally riveting when, when you sit back and watch it. So you have talked about how you love calling play-by-play -play for hockey. And so is this the sport that you think you want to stick with as you continue to progress in your career? Or would you ever want to make another move back into basketball and football like you used to um, call it Fordham? Well, I, look, I'm never going to turn down a broadcast opportunity. <laughs> uh, for a few years, I did get to do some basketball back in the early 2010s. Uh, I would do, and it was an annual event uh, for the Big East. I would do the Women's Big East Tournament, uh, the opening round. So in the Women's Big East, back before they kind of splintered and, and you had like different conferences now because it's kind of broken up into two. But back when it was the much larger conference, the way that it would work is you would have every team in the Big East play in the tournament, but the bottom eight teams on day one would basically play, have like a play in round before they would go advance and then play against the higher rated seeds. They didn't televise that. They streamed it online, but they wouldn't put it on ESPN at that point. So I was hired to be their broadcaster. And I think I did three or four years of this where I would go out to XL center and call a bunch of women's basketball games, just, you know, bing, bang, boom, back to back to back. And uh, so it's been a while, but I have done some women's basketball. You know, if you're a broadcaster, you, you broadcast whatever's presented in front of you. This is my 18th season of doing hockey. I don't, I don't want to stop. I love it. I love broadcasting hockey. I really enjoy working with the whale and even more so with the Quinnipiac Bobcats and the Bobcats have one of the best division one programs in the country on the men's side. Uh, they haven't won a frozen four yet. They've been to two frozen fours, I think in the last seven or eight years, uh, but they are a team that consistently is ranked uh, in the, in the top 15 in the country. They're currently ranked number 11 in the nation, the women are often just outside the top 10 uh, in terms of the NCAA and playing in the ECAC. It's one of the best conferences in the country for college hockey, where you have uh, some non Ivy league schools, but in normal years, you'll have the entire Ivy league. They're not playing this season. So the hockey is extremely competitive, very fast paced, a lot of fun. So I don't anticipate not doing hockey uh, in the future, but for sure, if I get any, freelance opportunities to call basketball or football and I can make it work. I'm, I'm not going to say no. Well, I was going to ask you about Quinnipiac too, because uh, we don't necessarily have the hockey culture here at Fordham, but you know, a lot of schools do across the country. I've got a sibling at Northeastern, another big hockey school. And just there, it's a big, it's a big sport at a lot of schools. Quinnipiac's one of them. They've graduated a lot of NHL talents. A lot of people will know Devin Taves, obviously the most recent mm -hmm. one. So what's it been like being a part of that program? You mentioned one of the top ones in the country and you've been calling games for them quite some time. It, it's been great. They really have a wonderful culture, both on the men's and women's side. Rand Pecknold is in his 27th season as head coach mm -hmm. with the Bobcats. He, he basically took the program when he started there as a very young man. He's still a relatively young man. He's in his early 50s, uh, but he was in his 20s when he was the named the head coach of at that point, the, you know, I think it was still Quinnipiac College. I don't even know if they were a university yet at that point. They were still a Division three program. I think his office was like a broom closet. It's one of those really, uh, those stories that you hear where someone literally starts a program from scratch. And Rand did that. He took that program from Division three to Division one, And within a few short years, ended up in Atlantic Hockey and then an ECAC and has built sort of a regional powerhouse in the state. It's certainly the, the prolific team in the state of Connecticut. UConn's a relatively new program. They're starting to grow a little bit. But when it comes to hockey within the state of Connecticut in college hockey, uh, Quinnipiac is really where it's at. 
uh, for both the men's and women's programs. And we play in a great building, the People's United Center uh, up at Quinnipiac. It's a really interesting setup for how the campus arena is set up. There's actually two buildings. It's one building with two different uh, arenas. There's a there's an ice hockey only arena. And then on the other side of it is a basketball only arena. So they don't have to share. And each one holds about like 3,000, 3,100. And the men's program sells out every single game. I mean, when there are fans allowed in, into hockey games, they are a consistent sellout. The students, you know, really bring it. They have a great atmosphere. Uh, when you have Quinnipiac playing Yale, which is right up the road in New Haven, Hamden's one town over, or if they're playing Cornell, uh, which is a big Ivy League conference opponent, the building's absolutely rocking. It's just such an amazing uh, college hockey atmosphere. A lot of fun to sit in that building and hear a roaring crowd and to get on the headset and, and call a game. And just, you know, it just, it's one of those things that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up. And uh, it's just a really exciting atmosphere. And the women's program too, they, they don't sell out their games, uh, but they do have a loyal following and the program is really good. Uh, they've been on the upswing. They had a 20 win season last year. They're seven and three this season. They play a really nice, fast, up-tempo game where all five players get involved and they score a lot of goals. They still may be near the top right now in NCAA women's hockey in terms of goals per game. And uh, just really being a part of that culture and being able to get back into college athletics. I had worked in pro for so many years and in the American Hockey League, things really changed. When I started in the NHL in 2006, it was still very much an old time hockey where you had a lot of physical play and the tough guys were still very big, especially with the Sound Tigers uh, where there were a lot of fights and, and I love it. I mean, I, I don't get me wrong. I love fights in hockey. It's not part of the college game, but over time, you know, the AHL really changed and it became more so of a development league and getting players ready for the National Hockey League. And winning is secondary. Winning is nice, but it's not the be all and end all for most American Hockey League teams, particularly with the New York Islanders organization. It wasn't about wins and losses for them. That's the great thing of working in college hockey because it really is about wins and losses. You want to develop players. And if they get to the next level and play pro, that's fantastic. But at the end of the day, it's about, you know, winning as many games as you can and getting into the NCAA tournament. So it really is that atmosphere where, you know, the hockey culture is about icing a winning team. And that's really what I want to be part of. You talk about culture and we want to shift back to your time here at Florida for one minute, because we always like to ask these of our guests about your favorite moments and memories because you were sports directors you mentioned for a couple of years here and you know the staff better than anybody else so what were some of your favorite maybe road trips or games or memories that you have uh, here at Ford? Oh my gosh I mean there were so many I got to start traveling my sophomore year I got to do a couple of road trips um, it was really just the day-to-day -day and the camaraderie that we had uh, as a staff really enjoying that time and being able to at that time the Patriot League for men's basketball and women's basketball, being able to go to all of those smaller schools, you know, the Bucknells and the Lafayettes and the Lehigh's of the world. And uh, Holy Cross at that point was a particularly fun trip. We got to do usually like one or two big trips a season. I know my senior year, we got to go down to Miami and play the university of Miami. And we spent new year's Eve in Miami, which was a, a great, you know, holiday break and all expenses paid trip to go down there. Um, but I think my time, aside from calling the games at Fordham, I was really passionate as a one-on-one -on -one host. And, and I did a lot of one-on-one -on -one shows during my four years at Fordham. And at the time, sports radio was really in its infancy. And during a good chunk of that time, uh, the fan WFAN radio did not have live and local on the weekends. So back then, if during the NFL season, you wanted to talk about football, you had to call us because you weren't calling the fan. The fan didn't have anyone on at that point uh, from 11 to 2 on a Sunday night. So being able to, in particular during the NFL season, and recap an NFL Sunday and sit there and take 30 to 40 phone calls over the stretch of three hours, one-on-one -on -one was a much different 
show then versus the one-on-one -on -one that we know today where uh, it's very wonderfully produced, which is great. Um, but there's a reason why it's New York's longest running sports calling show. Because back then on the weekends and night, we were heavily focused on calls and we may do guests every once in a while. I think in my four years of hosting one-on-one, -on -one, I spoke to maybe four or five guests. Wow. You know, you probably have four or five guests on every couple show. Of week. yeah, a couple uh, every yeah. couple of weeks, you have that level of interaction and produce segments. And and I've got to say, you know, being a student today at WFUV in terms of preparing you for a career in this business, you're in much better shape than we were back in the day. But in all honesty, very few of us. There's the names that you all know, right? I mean, they're the the Mike Breens and the Bob Papas and the Michael Kays of the world and the Chris Carinos of the world. Those names were the few and far between. Most of us, uh, and I'm lucky to be one of those people, obviously not in that stratosphere, mm -hmm. but someone that's been able to broadcast play-by-play -play for well over 20 years. But the vast majority of staffers finished their time at Fordham and then just like everyone else went off and got you know a normal nine to five job and had to work in the real world and their time in sports maybe ended when their time at Fordham was done. So, but at that point, being able to work on the weekends and take calls and really just kind of shoot the breeze with sports fans coming as a caller, being someone that was on the other end of the phone, that was really special to me. And, and I got to know a lot of the different callers. I'm Facebook friends with a few of them, uh, you know, over the years, they come back and they find you on Facebook or social media and they, they follow you. And it, it's great to be part of that community. Uh, but, uh, but I do think now, I mean, the way that WFUV has set itself up, uh, especially in the last like five or 10 years to really pivot and prepare students for a career in broadcast, whether on the air or off the air has been great. Uh, I've used Bob Aaron's, you know, back when Bob was running uh, the ship, you know, many times starting back in uh, 19, what year was that? I have to think back 1998, because we didn't even touch on the uh, very short time that I lived and worked in Iowa, right? Mm -hmm. We talked about uh, me being at Fordham, me being on the West Coast for a bit and then going to St. Louis. Well, in between that time, for about six months, my very first on-air job at a college in terms of being a paid professional was at a 5,000-watt station in central Iowa. And we had a summer full of content that we were producing for high school baseball and girls' high school softball. And the first person I called was Bob uh, to find some interns. And I did. Uh, that intern was Spiro Ditas, hmm. who came out after his freshman year and worked with me for a little bit and got to do some play by play and, and periodically over the years, whether I worked in minor league baseball with the river city rascals, I had Fordham students come out, uh, including Greg Jamborisi, who's with, who's been with the Lakewood blue claws for mm -hmm. like a thousand years now. <laughs> um, and then even when I was with the Bridgeport sound tigers, I had some uh, former students come out and, and work with me and, and do some stuff. And, and even students that would, do demos. I would open up the building and uh, set them up in the press box to be able to cut some demos. A couple of names you might know, uh, Dan Duva and Mike Watts, uh, both had opportunities to call hockey games off, off mic uh, in our building. Dan Duva, in fact, used a demo from a Bridgeport Sound Tigers game to get his first ECHL job. Uh, and then obviously now he's with the Golden Knights and he's a great guy and a fantastic broadcaster. So I've always believed personally, and I think many of us do, in terms of when we can give back and, and open doors for other folks that are with the WFEV sports program, we do that. I think it's important to us uh, to kind of give back because our time there, we got so much out of being a student, me in particular from Marty Glickman and being part of the staff, uh, really helping me grow as a human and an individual. Uh, it, it meant a lot to me. So yeah, over the years I've done that. So we've heard so much about your just incredible and successful career. And so as WFUV students, as people who work on one-on-one, -on -one, what is your greatest piece of advice to us? Enjoy the moment. And I say this to anyone that works in sports casting because you get a lot of, a lot of people really thinking about the end goal. And I was like that at a point, you know, especially earlier in my career where I, I was, okay, my goal is to be an NHL announcer. That's what I want to do. I don't think people realize how incredibly lucky you have to be 
to get one of those coveted positions on a full-time basis. And, and the same can be said for the NBA or the NFL or any top tier professional league. And in some respects, it's even harder than, the, than for the athletes themselves, right? If I'm on a hockey team, you know, there's, you know, 30 something NHL teams multiply it by 20, you have 600 N, uh, NHL players. Well, those teams have two play-by-play announcers, one for radio, one for TV. And every year you get more and more people joining the job market, wanting to be a play-by-play announcer. And while the opportunities have increased on a, on a global scale because of streaming and because of online to work on the air and be an on-air talent, uh, those opportunities at the top leagues, at the top levels really haven't changed all that much. So I do tell people to really enjoy the moment a, because you may never get to that pinnacle. You may never get to be an NHL announcer. I'm blessed because I got to call a handful of NHL games. I don't know if I'm ever going to get back to the NHL and call an NHL game again. And quite frankly, it doesn't matter to me. I love where I am right now. I'm at a high level. I really enjoy uh, calling Division One hockey. It's great for me. I love calling the NWHL. I've done three Isabel Cup championships, the first three, uh, where – they were very, you know, highly watched and very competitive. And they were very uh, high profile sporting events for women's sports. And I was super happy to be a part of those. Uh, but I took time at that point to really enjoy those moments because you don't know if you're ever going to get them again. And even as students, whether your time ends when you finish at Fordham or you go into the industry uh, on a full time basis, really enjoy where you are because honestly, I think back now in my two years with the Danbury Trashers, and it's been a very, very long time, has been some of the most fun times that I've had in sports. Just working for Jimmy Galante and being part of what was really a true family uh, of as a professional sports team, more so than any other team that I've worked with in being there on a daily basis and really cultivating relationships with the players, many of whom were in my age group at the time and I'm still friends with today. You know, if you're really just kind of thinking about getting that next job and either job hopping or, or forgetting about where you are at the moment, you're really taking away from your own life. You're really taking away uh, from those moments of being able to have fun and enjoy yourself and really just remember those moments because ultimately as well it's those times that are the building blocks for your future so it really does help you become I I think a better person but also a better broadcaster if you're really kind of savoring that time instead of just thinking about how do I go after that next gig and and move up the chain as quickly as I can because unless you're lucky uh, you got to be good but you also have to be lucky uh, you, you're not going to move up. Most people don't move up the chain that quickly, and it's a bit more of a grind. So en- enjoy the grind. Everyone, that is Phil Jubileo. Phil, thank you so much for being here and for sharing your experiences with us. We have really appreciated it. Thank you so much. It's been a blast. Thanks, Phil.